Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. OK Magazine has been way ahead of the curve when it comes to the situation in the Virgin Islands. You would think that some of the bigger outlets would have uh, a vested interest or would want to tell the story, but they're way behind here. Chris Spargo, especially from OK Magazine, has been doing a pretty good job of releasing this information b- before big outlets like ABC or NBC or any of the other legacy media outlets even have a sniff. So again, we're going to check out this article from Chris Spargo at OK Magazine, especially after the last article we read from this outlet. Uh, had a complete listing of how Jeffrey Epstein's money was being spent. And not only that, but all of that stuff was legit, right? All of it was true. So we're going to continue to follow the story in the Virgin Islands uh, on, on this morning's show. And we're going to do that with this article from Chris Spargo at OK Magazine. Headline revealed. Jeffrey Epstein's last financial transactions, $13 million to muzzle survivors, $3 million mansion for lawyer's wife, and $7 million to law firms. Oh, and 800000 in suspicious cash withdrawals. Now, going back to our FinCEN files and our talks about how the money laundering is the lifeblood, how the money laundering is what makes these people able to to continue on with these sorts of operations. And you see it here. The way this money was dispersed, the way this money was pulled out, and the way that these transactions were made, going back and thinking about what we learned in the FinCEN files, well, it's rather obvious what was going on here. And it's not even something that they were trying to hide. How many shell companies did this guy have? How many LLCs did this guy have? And nobody was the wiser, huh? The Trade Commission in New York, they weren't, they had no idea what was going on, huh? The SEC had no idea that Jeffrey Epstein was engaged in all of these douchebag type financial transactions. Nobody knew, right? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Jeffrey Epstein withdrew $800,000 in cash before his arrest, transferred millions to his survivors and pilots, and bought a $3 million house for his lawyer's wife. OK has exclusively learned. And remember, the last time we read the article from uh, OK, they had the, a really nice breakdown, a really nice rundown on how the money was being spent and dispersed and basically wasted. And that was way, what, four, five, six days ago, maybe seven at this point. And then ABC, which I, the article I talked about last night, came out and confirmed everything that was in uh, the the article from OK Magazine. So, again... They have some interesting stuff going on down there at OK, obviously. Um, Chris Spargo especially looks like he has a, a source or two in the Virgin Islands or has access to a source and has been doing really quality work. So again, this is another one of those type of um, news articles that's probably going to be ahead of the curve by about four or five days. And then we'll see other outlets start talking about it. An email sent to the judge overseeing Epstein's probate case by Virgin Islands Chief Deputy Attorney General Carol Thomas Jacobs details a number of these suspicious transactions, which also landed Deutsche Bank in hot water. Well, anytime you got a transaction of Jeffrey Epstein's, pretty sure you could trace it back to Deutsche Bank recently, right? That was his go-to bank. Those were the people that were handling his money and facilitating his criminal enterprise even after he was a sex offender. Oh, they'll say they didn't know. And they'll say, well, we have the SAR system set up. But in reality, you and I and everybody out there listening to this podcast, especially at this point, understands that these people are not stupid people. These aren't people that make those kind of mistakes. These are the kind of people that are calculating. And when it comes to these financial crimes, oh, they know what they're doing, folks. There's no doubt. 
Thomas Jacobs uses the complaint filed against Deutsche Bank by New York's Department of Financial Services to illustrate why the court should not be entertaining demands for more funds from Epstein's trust for his executors. And this is, we talked about this uh, on last night's program as well. It's a, uh, you know, a big deal that these guys aren't able to siphon the money off and and spend it however they want with at their discretion with no supervision. And that's what they've been attempting to do. At least one of those executors, Darren Indyke, is mentioned throughout the court documents for the role he played in helping Epstein access large amounts of cash and paying off young women. Well, look, in a, a, a perfect world where we had a real justice department and not just the just us department, these guys would all be wrapped up in a RICO case already. And we would know that everything that's going on with Indyke and Khan is just a shell game at this point. These guys are, are just waiting around to be indicted, basically. It's like there's chum in the water. These dudes can't help themselves. They're hungry, right? They have to eat. There's a bunch of hooks in the, in the water, right? Everyone, fishermen everywhere. And they're going to get snagged. Their behavior is well known to everybody who knows about this case and this story. And everybody understands an in-house personal lawyer like Darren Indyke most certainly holds the key to plenty of hidden secrets. So why this guy's an executor for the uh, estate and not a guest of the state at this point, I just, I don't know. I can't call it, folks. To be honest with you, I don't know. Over the course of the relationship, Mr. Epstein and his representatives used Deutsche Bank accounts to send dozens of wires directly and indirectly, including at least 18 wires into in the amount of 10000 or more to alleged co-conspirators who had been the subject of past press reports, states the DFS filing. So what they're saying is, these were known associates of Jeffrey Epstein, known conspirators of Jeffrey Epstein, known scumbag henchmen, in some cases, of Jeffrey Epstein's. And this money was getting sent out. Now, the hush money to the the survivors, I don't think that the bank really would be sarking that, right? I mean, they don't know how that money's, you know, uh, uh, getting to wherever it's getting to. But I'm talking about the co-conspirators here. Any of the co-conspirator scumbags that were known to be involved with Jeffrey Epstein, the bank has a responsibility to make sure that they're not involved in a huge money laundering operation. And the bank failed miserably. And sure, it was $150 million. That was the fine they had to pay. They had a bit of a financial slap on the wrist. But what did that, what is that really going to do? Is that going to deter this behavior from happening in the future? Is that going to stop these banksters from running these scams, from running these money laundering operations? Of course not. The only way is to directly make these people who are involved responsible criminally. Indyke, who was identified as attorney one in the below passage per Thomas Jacobs, also began withdrawing large sums of cash. And again, this is great work by uh, Chris Spargo and OK Magazine here. They have the actual text from the emails. And, you know, look, those, these are the, the, the actual words of the lawyers and what they're digging for as far as the estate goes and Indyke goes and their very large and growing investigation. So it's always a, uh, a nice little treat to get some information directly from the parties involved. In 2008, just prior to the bank's closing of the Park Avenue branch, which was located nearby Mr. Epstein's house, Attorney One withdrew $100,000 in cash on behalf of Mr. Epstein. When later questioned why Attorney One withdrew these sums from the bank, Attorney One reported that Mr. Epstein needed the funds for tipping and household expenses, the report reads. Tipping and household expenses, huh? We know that Jeffrey Epstein wasn't 
a generous man unless it has something to do with furthering his own plans and plots. So what do you mean tipping? What, everyone that comes in the house is getting a C-note? All of a sudden, he's uh, Henry Hill from Goodfellas going to the Coca Cabana, slipping everybody a couple of fuzzles? Stop it. Pay off money, hush money, and money to keep people quiet. That's what this money was, household expenses. In total... In a roughly four-year period, Attorney One withdrew on Mr. Epstein's behalf more than $800,000 in cash from Mr. Epstein's personal accounts. So again, don't tell me that Indyke wasn't locked to the hip to Epstein. Don't tell me that Indyke shouldn't be on the receiving end of a fat Rico charge because he most definitely should, in my opinion. This guy is culpable. This guy has been a key cog in what Epstein has going on for decades decades, and he has been a key figure in making sure that it runs as smoothly as it did. The estate is also accused of misleading prosecutors in the case filings. When the government asked the estate to confirm that it was not paying legal expenses for other individuals, the estate responded that it was only paying the legal expenses of two former employees, states one court document. Okay, and who are these former employees? And why why is the estate paying for their legal fees? Again, like I talked about last night, so the survivors are paying for the legal fees of the people who abuse them? How is that right in any any reality? How is that okay? That shit is not okay. And as much as I'm yelling and screaming about Denise George, I'll be yelling and screaming about that. If you want to get some legal uh, uh, um, help and you want some quality attorneys, you're more than welcome to go get them. I'm not saying anyone in this case who was accused or otherwise shouldn't have legal representation. But what I'm saying is if you can't afford your own quality lawyer, well... Welcome to being poor, welcome to not being part of polite society, and welcome to a public effing defender. The estate should not be paying the legal fees for anybody, including Indyke and Khan. In fact, the estate's last quarterly accounting confirms it is currently paying the fees of a law firm representing an immigration attorney the government has reason to believe was retained to seek immigration status for survivors of Epstein's and other sexual abuse. So, again, Indyke and Khan, up to their, up to their tricks, playing silly games and being involved up to their forehead in all of this. I don't understand how these two dudes can be executors for this estate. I talked about that at length last night when we read the ABC article and added a little more context. And again, adding some more of that today with this article. But it is really a serious problem going on down there. It is seriously something that needs to be watched because these two guys, Darren Indyke and uh, Richard Kahn, are legit like supervillains almost. These two dudes somehow weaseled their way into the the executor's role when they are so involved in what went on here. I'm not saying they were involved in the actual abuse of girls, but when you have a large criminal enterprise like this, it is not just the abuse of the girls or the sex trafficking that we're talking about, right? There are a lot of other people that facilitated that behavior, and those people cannot be allowed to walk away from this scot-free. There can't just be a couple of sacrificial uh, 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 sentences here. This needs to be about justice, and it needs to be about everybody who is involved, everybody that can be tied in with evidence. All of those people must be charged, and they all must be convicted. Because let me tell you, a guy like Indyke, If a moron like me can put the pieces together that this guy is as guilty as sin, well, I'm sure that there are investigators out there and prosecutors that can do the same. Because it's not that hard, folks. It is obvious that Darren Indyke was a huge part in what was going on. And it is also obvious that for some reason, this guy is still skywalking above the law. The Attorney General's office also used the filing to stress the argument that Indyke and co-executor Richard Kahn were complicit in Epstein's efforts to silence the survivors. 
They were. What do you think these guys, what do you think their role was? One was an accountant and one was a lawyer. What do you think? They were sitting around playing Jenga all day in the office? Of course not. Their their job was to maintain a, a, a veil of silence around Jeffrey Epstein, around Ghislaine Maxwell, to make sure that this operation continued to operate in a manner that suited those who put it into play. That's what it was all about. As you know, the government's amended complaint alleges that Epstein maintained a network of corporate entities that were used to fund and conceal the trafficking of women and girls in the Virgin Islands. Again, for those of you who might not have understood at the time when I was going through the Finson files how it all tied in, well, here you go. It is all about the money, folks. It is always all about the money. No matter the situation, no matter what stage the, play, the, the actors are acting on, it all comes down to money for these people. If they don't have that illegal money, if they don't have ways to use banks to, to, to fraud people, to have money laundering operations, and to have God knows what else sort of scumbaggery going on, then these sort of operations cannot maintain themselves for decades for years, the way Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell's criminal ring did. It is absolutely impossible to do it. And yet, no regulation. Nobody steps up. Nobody goes to jail. But you see here, what when we talk about this, these shell companies, these entities, these corporate entities that were used to conceal funds, you now can go back and say, oh yeah, I see what that's about. The Finson files, I see how that all ties in. And at the end of the day, that's what we're doing here on this podcast on a daily basis, right? Taking a journey together because I'm learning as much as I'm uh, as anyone on a, on a daily basis when we go through these articles. I mean, what we're like 720 something articles deep now. So we have a, a long ongoing conversation here over a year long and we just keep adding context to it. We keep adding layers to it and we keep adding some meat to the bone. And when you keep doing that and you keep on a project like this, eventually things are going to start to make sense and pieces of the puzzle are going to start to fit together. And that is what we've had in the last three, four months. And it's starting to really come together now. And... As long as the prosecutors and these attorney generals, they're serious about pursuing justice, there is plenty here for them to not only get the indictments, but to get a lot of convictions. The complaint also alleges that the co-executors were principals in many of those entities, reads the filing. These entities held the islands at which the women and girls were abused and the private planes and other vehicles on which they were transported. A consent order entered by New York's Department of Financial Services against Deutsche Bank and documents obtained by the government make clear that the substantial transfers from the accounts held by the companies and Epstein's tax-exempt foundation, over which co-executor Indyke also had authority, were made to models and other individuals suspecting, suspected of having recruited and or abused Epstein survivors to Epstein's house managers and pilot and to co-executor Indyke's spouse for $3 million to purchase a home, for example. All of that information makes it very clear that this was a criminal conspiracy of epic proportions with many different layers and many different people participating. Now, everybody who had a leadership role should be charged uh, accordingly as members of a criminal enterprise in a leadership role. They should get the extra years. They should get the extra time. And every one of these people that received ill-gotten gains from Jeffrey Epstein should have their assets frozen until we can figure out who was involved and who wasn't. That's the way this game is played, uh, if you're an Italian anyway. If you're an Italian and you're accused of being in the mafia, they don't wait for uh, a conviction. All your shit gets frozen. Good luck trying to pay your lawyers and good luck trying to raise your family and help your kids eat. But Jeffrey Epstein's friends, bah, no Rico for them. Screw that. These guys all get to do whatever they want. Or I should say, were able to do whatever they want. 
Now, people are hip to what's going on, and at the very least, it looks like we're moving in a direction of justice. And if this case continues to grow, and if we continue to see subpoenas, and we see people like Leon Black getting dragged into this, kicking and screaming against their will, the only logical next step is to grow the investigation with more indictments. The filing also claims that Epstein paid $13 million to the survivors and their lawyers after his sweetheart deal back in 2008. Although payments related to legal expenses are not inherently suspicious, Mr. Epstein also used his various accounts for what appear to have been multiple settlement payments totaling over $7 million to law firms, as well as dozens of payments to law firms totaling over $6 million for what appears to have been the legal expenses of Mr. Epstein and co-conspirators. So, they're being called co-conspirators by the Attorney General. And again, I know I'm going, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but it's that important that everybody who's listening out there understands this was a criminal enterprise, not enacted by one or two people, not run by one or two people. This was a vast criminal enterprise with at least seven or eight core members who made everything run, who knew what was going on and who in some cases engaged in abuse themselves, and yet this crew of bipedal serpents somehow finds themselves in possession of a non-prosecution agreement that protects all of their bitch asses. Well, we'll see what the 11th has to say about that. Lawyers for the estate have pushed back on these claims, but are still being forced to petition the AG's office to release funds towards the estate's expenses. So, look, the lawyers for the Epstein estate have not had a good excuse for the use of this money. They've provided no receipts, and they've done nothing this whole entire time but make shit harder. This process should be moving at a chugging pace at this point. These survivors should be getting paid out already. There should be no douchebaggery. And there certainly should not be the fingerprints of Indyke and Khan anywhere near this. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. All right, everybody, I'll be back later on and, you know, we'll do it again.